you're enjoying Racing World, it's brought to you by Perspective Group. It's your global motorsport podcast show brought to you in conjunction with Race Control Magazine. Well, hello and welcome to the first edition of Racing World for 2022. Yes, we've been a little late coming to you this year, but we've got lots of good reasons to back that up. We've spent the last few weeks in uh, pretty big discussions with IndyCar about what we can do with them this season, and uh, we're really pleased to announce that there's a whole raft of things that we'll be able to deliver each week on Racing World around the NTT IndyCar Series and the Indy Light Series and the Road to Indy Series all in uh, 2022. And for New Zealand viewers, it'll certainly be an exclusive uh, look and chance to talk with all our heroes over there from Scott Dixon, Scott McLaughlin, Billy Fraser, Jacob Douglas, and more hopefully one day soon. But as summer starts to wind down in New Zealand, if you're a New Zealand viewer or if you're an overseas viewer, then summer may be starting for you. But for here, it's starting to come to an end. And one of the big highlights that my company's been involved in this year is Western Springs Speedway. And Lucas Oil Western Springs Speedway has been up against just countless challenges really this year with uh, dealing with the COVID crisis that the whole world has been surrounded by but it's impacted on Western Springs more than many other venues but at the end of the day they were able to get away a lot of meetings there's one more meeting to come March 26th so if you're in the Auckland area or around the world actually uh, check out the Western Springs Facebook page we've got a link here for it and you'll be able to watch the live stream from Western Springs for the biggest showdown end of season show that they've probably put on in many recent years so It'll be a great feast. And for those of you who need a bit of a taster of the action from Western Springs, this is what's happened so far this year. The entire front end there of the current 1NZ, Lance Bell getting caught up in the mix as well. As we've got big tumble there, and just as we talked about it, that's Terence Durrell by the looks of the 22. He dominated here, and the KB Tanks, number 97 of Ben Morrison, takes out your feature here tonight. But the win goes to Daniel Thomas. Gilford looking to bring home his first feature win here at Luke's Little West Spring Speedway. And that, ladies and gentlemen, celebration or not, that is... A feature celebration, and there is our win from hero to zero, Max Gilford. Alarju's high side gets out of shape, he hits the wall, and he's over. We've got nine laps left to run for Auto Super Shot Sprint Car Masters. Pickens is your pace center. Now the outside, Pickens goes early, and we are racing. Just as we head into turn one, a big up and over for the 51. So Pickens leads the 88 of Eden Darth. Here we go back to Dean Cooper, Daniel Thomas, and Dion Kendo. And our winner for tonight for round one is the Auto Super Shop, Michael Pickens. Oh, and Regan Tyler gets in there as well. As does we got a big flyer down here. Jamie McDonald up and over multiple times. As does the two cars down the back. He goes early once again. As we see cars get out of shape, we've got multiple cars around. Well, plenty of great action there at Western Springs. And don't forget, March 26, one more meeting. You'll be able to check that out live. You can watch the live stream. Just check out the Western Springs Facebook page or the Western Springs Speedway site, and they're both linked for you here so that you can get in touch with them. It'll be a great meeting. Level of presentation and driver standard and everything at Western Springs is world class. And if you're wanting to see some good Speedway action, that's the place to be. So March 26, circle that one in the diary for the live stream from Western Springs. 
Now, turning our attention to IndyCar, and certainly round one at St. Pete was a, a fantastic event. Uh, we were not able to do the show from there, but we're back in and full swing, as we've said, and there's some great things coming with IndyCar this year. Uh, the standout, obviously, was Scott McLaughlin, which we'll talk about shortly, but Will Power returned to the podium along with Alex Palau, the series champ, and uh, Alex certainly saying, I'm here and I'm hungry for title number two. A lot of pressure then within the Ganassi outfit, which we'll talk about shortly as well. But for Will Power, when you see him in a happy mood, it's probably uh, one of those things where you need to be, if you're another driver, you need to be a bit careful because one, you can be taken out in a press conference and then secondly, he's going to perform on track. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm I'm happy. I mean, willpower. Well, man. I'm trying to make you happy. I'm, I'm always because happy. I want you to be comfortable in this series, but <laughs> not too comfortable. I yeah. don't want you to win anymore. Yeah. It's a bit of a problem. Let's, yeah. Let's take yeah, some from the I'll video. I'll try to. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Let's take a couple from the video news conference. So let's begin with David Turner. David, go ahead, buddy. Yeah, good morning, everyone from New Zealand. Well, first of all, I'm envious that you guys are out of lockdown because we're still in lockdown down here and um, it sucks, to put it in your terminology. Big thing for you, um, great to see a Penske 1-3 on the podium. How much off-season work's been done to achieve that? Yeah, a lot, a lot. We had one of our worst seasons last year and a very disappointing Indy 500. So been a lot of uh, reflection and development um you know to try understand what what that was and definitely have turned up with better cars there's no question uh, definitely different philosophy and um right right in the window so um and it's showing on the track like from the moment i was on track on friday the car was fast and really haven't changed much at all does it make does it make a difference the fact that you're now a three car team as opposed to being a four car team? Is that impacted on it at all? No, not really. I mean, you know, uh, we we got some of the guys from that fourth car, which probably you know add a little bit of quality to the pit crews, but the pit crews are already pretty solid. Um, pit stops are all good. Um, not really. I mean, that Penske can comfortably run four cars um, and not really take away from anything. So um, it's just a little more quiet in the engineering office now. <laughs> well, as, as a Kiwi, uh, I appreciate the uh, trans-Tasman sarcasm because I understand it. And uh, yeah, great to see you on the podium and uh, well done today. Yeah, thank you. Great to see willpower in one of those sort of moves. Always very humorous. There's a sense of uh, sarcasm that comes to the, the fore, if you like, and uh, there's always plenty of humor around there. But he has some good points, and he had some good points about yellow flag periods, which he's been going on for years in IndyCar, and then also the blue flag recently and how maybe that needs to be conducted. But, you know, time will tell. Power later went on to test at Texas in a test there and uh, unfortunately crashed, so that may have changed the mood slightly. Uh, but he'll be set to go this weekend at the Texas race and uh, you know you just can't rule him out on ovals he's become quite an oval king over recent years and I expect to see him chasing up front and of course then there's Scott McLaughlin now what can you say about this he was second at Texas last year so we're expecting pretty good things out of him this year topped the team test there uh, just a week ago I don't know if you can read too much into that because there wasn't a lot of teams there um, it was mainly a Chevy test in the end so a little bit hard to read into that one but certainly goes in with good form and momentum on his side after a win in St Pete and that win was uh, a long time coming uh, you could see that it was going to come he's the sort of driver that's going to deliver and at the end of the day Penske wouldn't have hired him unless they felt he would deliver so it was a very very happy Scott McLaughlin. And the biggest hurdle that he found from some of the media was the fact that they were referring to racetracks in New Zealand, and uh, I had to correct them on the pronunciation of one track, uh, as you'll see. Hey, Scott. Well, congratulations from New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, it's pronounced Pukakaui, isn't it? So, um, yeah. <laughs> no, <it's not> <laughs> looking, looking ahead, uh, Texas is next up. Texas was a great shootout with Dixon there last year. Obviously, now with uh, a fantastic result over the weekend, is that going to put any more pressure on you to, to have another good result at, at Texas or it's just business as normal now with the new engineer and stuff around you as well? Yeah, business is normal. Um, thankful that we're going to have a test day before then too at Texas. So, um, you know, we'll be able to fine tune some things before we go there. We're going to have a little bit of a different downforce package from IndyCar as well. So it will be interesting. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fully, fully uh, you know, prepped to, like I said, 
if I'm not on the ball, I'm going to start 20th and I don't want that to happen. So um, I'm going to work hard. It's business as usual. It's the first race. I'm not getting ahead of myself. It's just a head down, bum up and make it happen. And then just just finally, as a, as a part of that, obviously the Kiwi contingent is uh, very set to travel uh, in the coming months when our border restrictions ease and uh, the influx of New Zealand fans probably around the month of May. What does that mean to you emotionally if you, if you see a bunch of New Zealand flags, say, in the grandstands or around the paddock at Indy or at any of the other tracks across the season? Oh, it's huge. Um, and it makes me want to run up the front more and, and make the trip worthwhile. <laughs> Uh, alongside Scotty, we, Scotty's always going to be there. Um, but uh, yeah, like I've I'm really appreciate all the support that I've had. You know, my phone's been going crazy. My Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it, it's been crazy. Um, you know, Kiwis are a proud bunch and we love being the underdog. And I felt like I was a little bit like that. I feel like we're a little bit the underdog still at the moment, regardless of this win. I feel like we can... Yeah, have a lot of fun this season. Um, see what we got, and, and um, yeah, hopefully when I see the Kiwis, it's going to be awesome, and and even the Australians too. Yeah, yeah, even the Australians as well. Um, well, once again, congratulations. This is the beginning of the new chapter, uh, year two in IndyCar, and we wish you all the very best. Thanks, David. Cheers, mate. Great effort there from McLaughlin and certainly, you know, he's got the Kiwi support and the Australasian support for that matter. And uh, he's proved his worth everything from Super Tour in the early days where I first met him. Uh, he was a young 19 year old at Ruapuna and he had aspirations for big things and he's ticking those boxes. And uh, that comes from hard work. Uh, there's nothing short of that. And with hard work comes reward. And that's a saying at Penske's as well. And we're certainly going to see that. And I think there's more to come this season. I think he'll be strong at the Indy 500 as well. Person who probably had a bit of a mixed bag weekend was New the other New Zealander, Scott Dixon. Um, they ran a different race strategy in the race at St. Pete. Maybe that was uh, to their disadvantage or not, but we did get the chance to catch up with Dixie after the race. A uh, little bit poor video quality here, but you get the general impression from him. The way we went with the strategy that we did, it kind of put us in a big hole. Uh, the car felt really good, especially on the reds early on. We were just kind of looking after it, maintaining pace. And then uh, just, you know, every time we need a clear track, we got lap cars or traffic or whatever, so just no real flow to it. So, uh, get me a bummer and, uh, you know, not where the car should have finished, I think. St. Pete never been one of those tracks that Dixon's necessarily shone at. It's always been a bit of a bogey track for him, but you know, the season is long, 17 races, it's only one part of it. One thing that he's consistent at is uh, finishing races. His record book at Texas is phenomenal, uh, so I'm looking forward to big things out of Dixon and the Ganassi team this this weekend at Texas, and uh, there should be no reason why we shouldn't expect that. be a tough race, but uh, you know, that's part of the game. Uh, the PJ1 racing surface, which is the middle groove of the track, which has an asphalt that was applied to it to make NASCAR racing better, unfortunately hinders IndyCar, so it does create maybe one lane racing, which we may see on um, on Sunday when the race happens, and, and that's just a byproduct of this PJ1 surface that they put down to allow for added grip up there, but it just it has the reverse effect for IndyCar. It's not something that you can just wash away and go, okay, well, there's no P1, PJ1 surface there anymore. It's there to stay, uh, and unfortunately, IndyCar pays the price with it, so I hope that that doesn't really impact on the race, but it, it could uh, because of the fact that it creates a little bit more of a one-lane racetrack. Now, back to St. Pete, another Kiwi that just uh, did phenomenal in his debut Indy Lights race, uh, young hunter McElroy. Now, I'm a fan of McElroy, as it's well known, uh, and been associated with him for quite a long time, know his dad very well. But again, these are one of these things that come from effort equals reward, and Hunter certainly proved that, and took out pole position in his very first Indy Light race at St. Pete. Unfortunately, the race didn't pan out that way, and he crashed midway through the race. But what we've seen here is that Hunter is more than capable of driving an Indy Lights car. He's with Andretti Autosport, a great team. Uh, and I really, really think that there's some good things ahead for Hunter McElroy. Might be a little bit of a downer moment now, but there's big things coming. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, pretty, pretty heartbroken right now. Um, obviously, leading comfortably and the uh, car was amazing, you know, just pulling away from the field and uh, yeah, I just made a mistake and ended up in the wall. So no room for error around street tracks. Um, but you know, lots of positives to take out of the weekend. It's a long championship. We were dominant car all weekend, and unfortunately, it just goes like that sometimes. So I feel bad for the team, all my sponsor supporters, but we'll be back. And uh, yeah, just a little disappointed right now, obviously, or very disappointed, but um, taking the positives and uh, eyes forward to Barber. 
certainly look forward to seeing Hunter. It's just a, a shame that uh, the Freedom 100 isn't held at the at the Indy 500 weekend anymore. There's no Indy Lights race uh, on the Indianapolis Oval. There is on the road course, but not on the Oval. And, and that's just a shame because I really would have liked to have seen him around there. But we're going to see a lot of Hunter McElroy. And uh, for those of you who are watching perhaps from overseas, this is a name to watch in the future. He's got good pedigree. He's come up. He's proved himself all the way through. A member of the Motorsport New Zealand Elite Academy. He graduated through that, Formula Ford in Australia, did his time in the Road to Indy series, and he's one of those ones that is a star of the future without a doubt. Now looking at other things, IndyCar was a big announcement from AJ Foyt uh, just a week ago now, and the fact that uh, J.R. Hildebrand is back with the team. He drove for them last year at uh, the Indy 500 in a pretty much one-off event, but J.R. is back for all five oval events this year. Now J.R. is one of those people, again, that can bring a lot out of the car, and returning to a team like Foyt where he knows what he's, he's got under him, they know what they've got under him, I just think it'll be great things in this very upbeat J.R. Hildebrand. And he's one that you would want to watch at Texas this weekend. Glad just to uh, be back with this group. And, uh, you know, we had, a, you know, I think on paper, maybe our, our, our May last year didn't look super special, but um, I really, I just really enjoyed it. It was a great, you know, sometimes you're getting thrown into a new team and, and you don't really know how things are going to go. And as an extra car last year, it was, you know, it felt, it felt sort of last minute, but um, really clicked with the guys and, and, uh, appreciated the work and kind of just the process of, of working through things. Um, you know, I felt like we, as a group, didn't feel like we rolled off the truck great necessarily. And within a couple of days had worked into the window and, and I mean, I had the best race car, best feeling car that I've had at the speedway in a long time last year, just within a couple of days. So I think that, you know, particularly like at this point in my career, that really you know, that matters a lot. Like that registers to you when you can make that type of progress really quickly. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm excited to be back with them and, and doing more racing. I mean, for me, that's exciting to be doing more, more of the races on the schedule. I really like the oval schedule that the series has right now. It's a, such a mixed bag of different, even like oval racing disciplines, you know, Texas is totally different. You know, we don't go to any other mile and a half now. It's a, it's a hard place. Um, you know, Iowa, a place that I've had a lot of success at in the past, um, and always enjoyed, like it's, that's been a track that for me, um, I've just, I've known what I needed there from the race car from the first time I rolled up. Um, and, and you, and more often than not, I've been able to find it with the teams, um, gateway too. I mean, I, I think the, the awesome thing about IndyCar racing generally right now, but particularly the oval racing is that there's nowhere that's easy anymore. You know, there's no, there's no flat out, you know, you're pinned for the entire race kind of places. So you really got to drive, you got to work with the team to get the cars hooked up. And um, I'm looking forward to that challenge. Then getting closer to the weekend now, uh, what, the big news this this week around IndyCar, which kind of really wasn't IndyCar, but it reflected on an IndyCar, was Zach Brown and Michael Andretti coming out with an announcement of the fact that Carlton Herter will uh, test some of the older F1 cars as part of the regulations that F1 have, where they can test a, a previous version of a car, not the current version, and Carlton signed a multi-year deal uh, with McLaren to do that. Came as a bit of a surprise because uh, you would have expected that Pato Award would have been there. He tested for them at Abu Dubai last year at the season ender and Pato was always earmarked for that. So naturally the press conference that was held before Texas, that was the hot question. And here's what Pato had to say. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think we're, we're all going to have to wait and see what, what, what that answer is, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know what, well, what, you know, I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to lie to everybody and say, no, 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 or, or yes, yes, yes. I just think it's, you know, we'll, we'll see how things shape out. I think it's early in the season to truly see what's what's going to be happening. Um, but yeah, you know, honestly, as of right now, I, like I said, I'm 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 fully focused into into delivering a season that I know I'm capable of with with the team that is around me, and then um, you know I'm sure things will start taking their place, and, and yeah very awkward times he's put it on a bit of a brave face but I think there's more to it there's always been this uh, rivalry between Herder and Pato anyway I uh, don't quite know what the, the gameplay is within McLaren but you know Pato when did you actually find out about this <laughs> um 
I knew a couple weeks back. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, she's never dull in McLaren world, that's for sure. And speaking of McLaren, as we draw our attentions now to the opening Grand Prix at Bahrain this weekend, plenty going on in McLaren as well. Not an overly great second test uh, last week there with Lando Norris having to pick up the reins for everything they did. Front brake issues, which is, wasn't an easy fix. They said that. Daniel Ricciardo out with COVID. Ricciardo may be back. And here's another real kind of curveball from Zach Brown really in the announcement of the fact that they've done a deal with Alpine to uh, borrow Oscar Petrani if they need him. Now Oscar has come out of F2, highly rated Australian, uh, absolutely no issues there at all, but never driven a McLaren. Uh, so somewhere along the line I guess they've done a seat fit and everything like that, but it seemed really strange when there was a bunch of drivers that were technically available um, to come into the McLaren fold and reserve drivers that they have on tap and then and they announced a deal with Oscar. So it was kind of a weird one. Will that come into play in Bahrain? We'll know in a couple of days. And by this time this podcast is, is on air, we'll have a, a better indication for it. But yeah, there was, a, there was a strange old week in the McLaren world. Other things that came out of that last test at Bahrain, Ferrari, reliable? Yes. Number of laps, fantastic. Have they got car speed? Yes, I think they have. Were they bluffing? Hard to, hard to know. But uh, Ferrari, I think... The expectations would be that they were back in the game. But just remember, a couple of years ago, we had the same scenario with Ferrari after Barcelona, and everyone thought, yep, they were going to be the team to beat, and then they failed to deliver come the first race. Not put in a downer on it, because I'm quite a supporter of Ferrari, but I will wait and see what comes out of Bahrain. And again, Bahrain's not necessarily a true form guide either. This will be the first race with these cars, so we'll just have to wait and see. Red Bull, yes, well, interesting, interesting combination of side pod structure that Adrian Newey's come up with them. Um, Verstappen obviously on a high, wearing the number one on the car. Uh, Perez is a, certainly a supportive teammate. Have we seen everything that Red Bull have got to play? No, I don't think so. I think that they're too smart for that game. So I'd expect to see some things particularly come qualifying for them at Bahrain this weekend and, and for them to feature. Um, big season for Formula One but you've got to just like IndyCar you've got to score points all season long Mercedes well that's an interesting one very interesting um side pod structure to the car uh, radical change from where they tested the car in Barcelona very very different um, some controversy now around the wing mirrors which Ferrari are asking the FIA for clarification over um, these little pedantic things if you like are enough to become a distraction Toto Wolff is too smart for that but in saying that Mercedes have never been under this sort of pressure before to perform were they sandbagging there seems to be some belief of the fact that they were don't know don't know it's a very hard one to know and again qualifying in Bahrain uh, on Saturday will prove one way or the other where the Mercedes are in this game or they're not but one thing for sure they've got the resource to get themselves in the game and they will get in the game the other teams pretty much what we expected the only surprise would be Haas and the fact that obviously there was all the issues around you know the Russia affair that's going on bringing uh, Kevin Magnussen back into the team probably a smart move because it's bringing someone in that the team know he knows them and uh, you know it's good for Mick Schumacher as well but both Magnussen and Schumacher are very high up in the timesheets uh, were they hero runs on low fuel and new tyres? Again, we don't really know. That's what testing's all about, and there's the element of bluff. But one thing we do know is that it was a relatively competitive car. The weakness, I think, at Haas is reliability. We've seen that time and time again with pit stops, engines, uh, just different small mechanical issues. If they can fix the reliability, I believe that they've probably got a car underneath them this year that can do the deed. So it will be very interesting because <clears throat> then it kind of creates a little bit of pressure around Williams, Alpine, Alpha Tori, who's going to be down at the bottom, you know, uh, is there going to be a new bottom dweller? So yeah, I think the Formula One season will be fantastic, just as the IndyCar season will be, and uh, there's some great things ahead. And as I said earlier in the show, Racing World is delighted to have a new arrangement with IndyCar. We will have access to drivers after races, be able to talk to them both pre-race and post-race, and we'll also be accessing the press conferences across the year. So Racing World will bring you closer to the IndyCar season and Indy Life 
rides than we have ever before. And we've got some other exciting announcements that we're going to make in the near future involving the Indy 500 as well. But until then, I hope you enjoyed this sort of season preview type show of Racing World. All our regulars will be back soon. There's a lot of new things coming to the show. We want to continue to develop this show as it turns into its second and a half year, almost three years old now. And uh, the aim of the game in 2022 is to raise the bar even more for you each and every week here on Racing World.